Hey yeah, and welcome back to another video. So today I'm going to be talking you through the best books that I read in 2020 and I'm so excited to do so because I read some incredible books last year and also it was my most productive year for reading. I read the most pages that I'd ever read in a year before which was just under 15,000 pages and it was also the first year that I'd never read any one star books whatsoever. So that's why you haven't seen any worst books of 2020 video because there really is no need for it. So before I get into my best books list, I just want to tell you that today's video is sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community that have thousands of classes for people that are curious about discovering new skills, want to improve existing skills, or just need the inspiration to get into the mindset to create something new. With classes on creative writing, film and video production, music production, graphic design, crafts, and many, many more, there's something for everyone. And you'll be introduced to a community of millions and be offered feedback on the work that you create within these classes. So, you know, I'm a big advocate for mindfulness and I've been talking about getting back into journaling recently and I've been doing it this month and I already feel the benefits of doing it. It just feels so great to get everything out of here and onto paper and I just feel like I can make sense of everything. So I've been thinking recently, how am I going to step this up? How am I going to take my writing to the next level? So I've been watching some nonfiction writing classes on Skillshare and one that I thought was absolutely wonderful and really Really beneficial to watch. It was called Writing the Truth, How to Start Writing Your Memoir by Mary Carr. So if you're familiar with the world of memoir, you know who Mary Carr is because she's an absolute live-in legend. She's an incredible writer and she has a great class on there talking you through how to write your memoir and the process of it. And she's very raw in it. She says like writing a memoir is probably going to be the hardest thing that you ever do in your life. But she gives you some really great tips on how to get yourself organized, what kind of notes you should be taking, how you should be organizing your notes, finding your story, you know, looking back into your past and figuring out what story do I really want to tell? What's going to resonate with my readers? Writing in a way that connects with your readers. And it's just a great class. Like even if you don't end up publishing something, it's still great knowledge to know. So that's the one class I'd say you should really check out because I really enjoyed doing it. Skillshare is curated for learning. So there are no ads, which means you can watch away without getting any distractions. And it's also affordable with being less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. And by using the link that I have below, the first thousand people to click it and sign up will receive a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. So if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, especially since it's a new year, you may want to brush up on some skills or learn something new, definitely check it out. And thank you so much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Right, so let's talk about some of the four-star binge reads that I read in 2020. The first one was Battle Royale by Koshin Takami. I was absolutely addicted to reading this. Um, at the time, I got through these 600 pages in just under three days. So I think that goes to show how glued I was to this. It is a great book for someone who may be going through a reading slump, who isn't afraid of gore or violence, who likes thrillers and action. I went into this thinking it might have been like targeted towards a younger audience, like a teen audience, but no, <laughs> definitely not. Um, so this is about a group of teenagers who believe that they're on a school trip and once they're on the bus, something happens and they end up waking up on a mysterious island where they find out that they're part of a lottery selected government program and their class has been selected to battle it out to the death where the last one standing is the winner and they get to leave with their life. So immediately what I loved about this is that the story started so quickly. It just hooks you in. Um, you get really invested into the various characters because each chapter jumps around from each character's perspective and you can really get into rooting for certain people. Even the bad characters, even the villains of the story, I was rooting for some of them because I thought they were so interesting and so manipulative and insidious and just, you know, they had a game plan and I really liked seeing the game plans play out. Also, like the way that the chapters were written, they were set up in a way that when they would end, it would tell you how many people were left on the island. And I found that that was a great way to keep me motivated while reading this, that I I was just saying to myself, okay, just one more chapter. I just want to find out what happens in the next chapter. Or sometimes I'd skip ahead and look to the next chapter. And if the 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 rate of people who were still alive was the same, I was like, okay, I can, I can stop reading it now. <laughs> I know that nothing happens in the next chapter. 
Uh, but yeah, I highly recommend this. Also, the translation was really good as well. I didn't notice any issues with it. Um, so yeah, this edition was really good. The next binge read of 2020 was The Terror by Dan Simmons. So I got this from the library at the time and I was really iffy about whether I was going to like it or not. I was assuming it might have been a DNF based on the plot. It's based on historical events, but you know, reimagined. It's about a crew of men who are stranded on the HMS Terror who get uh, frozen into the ice and they can't move the ship anywhere and they're waiting for spring and they end up having horrible food shortages. They end up suffering from horrible illnesses. And then you have like the paranoia of each person kind of turning on each other and people losing trust in each other. And then on top of all the real world issues, there is a monster that's out on the ice that's picking them off one by one. And it is great. Again, if you like gore, if you like a lot of action, this, the way this was set up, um, was that every couple of chapters there'd be some sort of event that would happen that would just keep you hooked. And uh, it wasn't one of those books where you have to read like 500 pages before you get the payoff of, oh, the monsters finally appeared. The monster appears pretty quickly within the story, which I always love because I hate when horror novels just drag it out. But yeah, this was um, a really, really surprising read. It was probably the most surprising read of 2020, the fact that I loved it so much and I can't recommend it enough for any horror enthusiasts to pick up. The next book I'm going to talk about is Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. So I got this a while ago and it was actually the first book that I read in 2020. It had been just sitting on my shelf for a while. I wasn't massively motivated to read it. To be honest, the only reason why I got it was because it's a classic that continuously pops up time and time again on various, you know, books you must read lists. And that was really my only motivation to read it was just to read it so I could cross it off one of those lists and say, yeah, I've read Rebecca. I didn't have any idea that it was technically a gothic novel. If I'd known that, I probably would have read it a lot sooner. But this was, again, a really surprising read because I had this whole notion about what it was going to be about and I was completely wrong. I had so many misconceptions about it and I was just so pleasantly surprised with it. This was a four star read and I'm sorry if I haven't said it, but all the other books that I talked about previously were also four star reads and then we're going to get onto the five star reads at the end of the video. This is the story of a young unnamed woman, an unnamed narrator who ends up marrying a widower and once she moves in with him because they have this kind of whirlwind romance and, you know, she doesn't really know him before she even marries him. And uh, she ends up moving in with him after they're married and she realises very quickly that his his dead wife, Rebecca, still very much lives in the house. Like her spirit lives on. Everything in the house is decorated to her taste. Um, She can't really make her own imprint on the place. And also the people who work in the house, the servants, seem to have some sort of bias against the new wife because they, they have like an allegiance with Rebecca. When I got halfway through the story, I had assumed that I knew exactly how it was going to end. And then something happened that completely floored me. And I was like, I was wrong. I was so wrong. I was, I thought this was going to be so predictable. And now I'm completely wrong about absolutely everything. So yeah, I'd really recommend this if you want to read more gothic stories. And it's very uh, easy to read. And it's a, it's a quick read as well. Next, let's talk about my reread of The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien. So I have been meaning to reread The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings series since I got the box set in 2012. Every year I've talked about it like multiple times being like, yeah, I'd love to get to this. And last year was the first time that I finally pulled The Hobbit off my shelf and read it. I read it in one session in about six, six, seven hours or so in one day. And it was such an absolute delight. Not only did I really appreciate it from reading it as an adult, because when you're little, you're just paying attention to the adventure of the story. You're not really paying attention to the details within the writing or how the sentences are structured or anything like that. But reading it when I'm older and looking back at it, you really can appreciate the amount of craft, not only in the writing itself, but just like in the world building, the characters. It's just so thoroughly fleshed out. It feels completely and utterly believable. Another thing while I was reading it is that I'd get to a paragraph and it would trigger a memory from when I'd be reading it the first time around when I was like 10 or 11 sitting in class. And it would give me this feeling of not only nostalgia, but like an ASMR sort of thing, because it would be at that time in the class where everyone was reading a book. Everything was completely quiet, but there might be some odd sort of room noises now and again. And it was just a very grounding experience. So based on that whole experience in itself, 
completely makes my review of this com like totally biased. As an adult, you might think that it's a bit bland, but if you go into it with the right mindset and you go into it saying, I really just want to enjoy this. I want to, I want a palate cleanser. I want something that I can just read for the pure bliss of it all then you'll probably really, really enjoy The Hobbit. Next, I want to chat about Far From the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy. So this is the first Thomas Hardy novel that I'd ever read. I know that people always say you should probably start with this, and I would have to completely agree. I didn't really know what to expect from this when I initially picked it up. I knew that there was a love triangle in it, and I knew that that is really not my cup of tea whatsoever. I don't care for romance. If romance is in a novel, as long as it's like a kind of a background sort of thing, it's fine. But if it's the main point of the, the plot, I really don't like that. However, this was so much more than your basic romance novel. Like in anything, you wouldn't call it a romance novel. It's more of the story of a young woman who really comes into her own and learns who she is as a person and like what she needs and basically that she doesn't really need a partner to function. So it's about this woman who is called Bathsheba and she inherits this farm and she's not massively keen about it, but she has to get on with life. And she meets the local handyman who also helps out on the farm, Gabriel. And when you meet Gabriel, you're like, he's the one. <laughs> but then we're introduced to two other male characters, um, Sergeant Troy. Don't even get me started about him. I, I If I start, I'm not going to stop. And also Farmer Baldwood who I ended up really liking. Baldwood really comes into his own at a certain point in the novel and you're just like, yeah! Um, and what I loved about this is that uh, Thomas Hardy writes in a way, or wrote in a way, that really captures your imagination. It's just punchy and it keeps you interested and there's no sort of um, moments of where there's like too much description or anything like that. It was just perfect for me. And the pacing was great and there's so many things that happen within this that uh, there's so much drama I love it I loved the amount of drama within this and at a certain point there's like some major sort of plot twists and you're just like well, this is crazy like this is not what I expected whatsoever so I really recommend this especially if you want to get more into reading um, classics and if you may have a hard time with reading classics or getting yourself motivated, this really does the work for you. Next, I have The Last Children of Tokyo by Yoko Tawada. So I'd never read anything by this author before. I'd heard of her through booktube, but I've never really seen anyone talk about this particular book before. And to be perfectly honest, what grabbed me was when I was in a bookstore, like maybe a year or two ago, I saw it and I thought the cover was absolutely beautiful. And once I picked it up and learned what the plot was about, I was like, I have to read this at some point. This sounds like something I'm going to really enjoy. So it's a dystopian novella where Japan has been forced to close their borders due to whatever has happened. And it's causing the children to be born very ill and very sickly. There's a lot of contamination that's happened to like the soil and the water. For some reason, older people, like the oldest generation, seem to have a new lease on life. They have no illnesses. They live for a very extended period of time, seemingly forever. And the way it's kind of shaped is that maybe that's some sort of punishment for this because it was a man-made disaster, but we know nothing more of that. And um, there's this really sort of heavy, melancholic sense that... Um, the oldest generation have to be forced to watch the destruction of the world. However, there's so much going on in this short, short story, but it's mostly the story of a grandfather and his grandchild. And the grandfather, Yoshiro, is looking after his grandson who is very, very ill. He tries his best to do what he can for him. I would say to anyone watching this video, if you're thinking about picking up any of the books that I talk about, make this one a priority because it is heartwarming and heartbreaking at the same time. It definitely was not what I was expecting because, you know, I love dystopian fiction, but this just got me in my feelings. I was like, oh, this this is hit too close to home. Um, but yeah, it's absolutely beautifully written and I can't recommend it enough. Now we're going to get on to something chunky. I'm going to talk about The Stand by Stephen King. So uh, I did it. <laughs> I read it. Um, you can see where I gave up on freaking tabbing this. I just started writing notes instead. This was interesting. The last time I talked to you about this, I said that 
I think I'd said that I didn't know whether to give it four or five stars. I decided to give it four stars because I knew in my heart that if it was a five star read for me personally, I would have known. Like there would have been no debate about should I give it four stars or should I give it five stars? So yeah, definitely my favourite Stephen King novel so far. You know that I'm not, I'm, I wouldn't be his biggest fan. Like I like some of his books, but I find him very hit and miss. And I always have to say that in case like this is someone's first video. The Stand just hit me differently and it's not really what I expected it to be. This is the story of a plague that has pretty much killed the majority of human beings on the earth. There is a small minority of people who were not affected by the virus who are seemingly immune to it. The virus within this, it's so brutal the way it's described and you learn about it right away. What I really enjoyed about this book is that from the very first page we are in the shit because I find that sometimes with Stephen King novels that you have to do a good amount of reading before anything sort of happens in it. Uh, I find that a lot of his books, uh, it's usually the last, you know, 50 pages where things start to get really interesting. Whereas the, with this, like the shit has hit the pan from page one. I loved a lot of the characters within this. There's a lot of characters who, you know, you can kind of relate to at first and they're in these horrible situations and they're just surrounded by death. They're surrounded by the death of their loved ones. And they have to process all these emotions so, so quickly and just figure out a way to find other people, to see if there's any more survivors, to kind of connect together to see what's left for humanity. And um, at its core, it's a story of good and evil. And there is moments in this that got me. There is one specific moment in this that I was not anticipating whatsoever. And when it happened, I was so annoyed at myself for not recognising it sooner. It was a reference to another Stephen King book and I just feel so dumb for not picking up on it because once Mother Abigail started talking about it, I was like, I'm so dumb. <laughs> but I think what I loved about this the most is that not only am I reading about something that's just hard to read about when we're going through a pandemic ourselves, I really, really enjoyed the characters and I was able to get into reading all about like the whole character development aspect and, you know, seeing certain characters who really believed themselves to hold themselves to a certain standard. And then because of the situation that they're in, they're just forced out of character. But I would say that it's definitely not as hard to read as you may perceive it just based on the length. If you find that you're able to gel with it once you start reading it, you're not going to have an issue. If you if you do kind of find yourself struggling, then you're not going to have the same experience that I had. But um, it is definitely worth the read. And if you want to challenge yourself to a chunkier book, I'd say definitely pick this one up. Next, I'm going to chat about The Colour Purple by Alice Walker. So this is another one that I got from the library that I read last summer. I didn't really know what to expect from this. My only experience with the story is when I saw part of the movie when I was younger and I saw a very traumatising part of it. So I had a completely different view of what the story was going to be about based on that small clip that I'd seen as a child. And that's what had been putting me off reading it for such a long time. But once I started reading it, it's written in a format where it's all letters. So Celie, who's the main character, who starts out as a young girl. She's, I believe she's like 13 or 14 when we start the novel and she's writing letters to God and talking about her experience, how other people treat her. And it's really, really heartbreaking. And it probably has one of the hardest openings to a novel that I've ever read, just based on the abuse that's described. However, once you get past that and you get more into Celie's life when she's older, like in her 20s or so, I mean, she's still being treated badly by the people around her. But once she meets Shug and she really becomes her own person because of Shug's influence, because originally she's kind of mousy, she's kind of timid and she doesn't really talk back when people are mean to her. And um, it's not just a story about that though. It's mostly a story about Celie and her sister. Like eventually she starts writing letters to her sister instead of God. And it is such a heartwarming story by the time you get to the end of it. And there was moments in this that like it, I kind of ran away with myself while I was reading because I'd get so wrapped up within these characters and what was happening to them. Um, I had a reading vlog at the time when I was reading this and there was a particular moment that I was just done with the book. I was so angry over 
a certain thing that happened in it. And you can see it in the video that I was just, I just had enough. I was really, you know, when a story doesn't go the way you're hoping and you're just, just annoyed at characters for acting so selfishly and all that kind of thing. Yeah, I just got really wrapped up in it. But I think that goes to show the level of quality within the writing that I was able to get that passionate about this book. It's definitely now one of my new favourites. This was just, oh, it was such a wonderful story. It was such a wonderful story. And I felt bad then for not picking it up for so long. But I think that the colour purple was just absolutely splendid. And now to get into the five star books. The first one is The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Now, this was the first uh, book that was over a thousand pages that I've ever read in my life. I was massively intimidated by the size. I had seen some really great book reviews on this done on booktube, like Books by Lanes was the person who basically sold me on picking this up and I was not disappointed. If this book could have gone on forever, I would have been happy with that. Like the size of it once I started the story did not faze me at all. It really reminded me of kind of binge watching a, a mini series or something like that. This is about a young man who ends up being imprisoned and he's imprisoned for something that like, you know, he didn't do. And he spends a very long time in prison, even though the majority of the book is him after he's gotten out. But this has like the most iconic jailbreak that I've ever experienced in my life. It was so hardcore. It was metal. It was just uh, like when I read it, I was like, am I actually reading what I think I'm reading? And uh, later on in the novel, there's a reference to the jailbreak again, being like, just in case I need to remind you of how hardcore that jailbreak was. Um, but yeah, the size of it wasn't an issue because um, there's moments where you are given a little bit of a recap. So if you're reading this over a long period of time, you're really not going to have an issue with forgetting certain parts because you are given like little tidbits here and there just to be like, oh yeah, let's bring you back to that particular moment or that particular character. There's so much that goes on in this. And to be honest, the Count's story, I was, I mean, I was really invested in it, but I even got invested in the side stories within this, like the side characters, like the people, like you might regard that aspect of those, you know, of the story to be filler. I loved it. I thought it was great. Like the there was a, a certain poisoning that was going on and, you know, finding out all the drama around that. At its core, it is the story of revenge and getting the people back who had the Count falsely imprisoned. And it is such a slow burn, like the patience on him for like this, the, the retribution. He just doesn't care if he's waiting decades. He's going to get these people back. And I really appreciated that level of pettiness. What I loved about this is that it reminded me what I love about reading. It reminded me what it's like to be a reader, to fall in love with reading for the first time. It took me back to my childhood when I'd read certain series because, you know, I was reading this for such a, like I was reading it for about a month or so, but it took me back to when I'd be completely devouring a certain book series as a young child and thinking like, wow, reading is amazing. <laughs> I just had that feeling. I was like, reading is actually fabulous. Please don't be put off by the size of it because the story just keeps you gripped. It is incredible. The quality of writing is just superb. There's many references to, um, things that I would associate with Skyrim. So I ended up listening to the Skyrim soundtrack for the majority of the time that I was reading this, which just completely elevated the reading experience, if I'm going to be perfectly honest. But yeah, this was my second five star book of the year. Right. Sorry if there was any awkward angle changes there, but I've had to turn on my big lights as it started raining now really heavily. So yeah, we're going to we're going to get on with it. Anyway, we are now on to the best book that I read in 2020 the book that I knew was a five-star read after the very first chapter. It has to be the autobiography of Malcolm X. I did not expect to get so emotionally invested in this. And you know, what? it's something that I'd put off reading for years because I always thought that it was going to be quite academic. I always thought I had to build my way up to reading it. I didn't realise that I could just read it like it was an autobiography, you know, like it's intended to. Um, so this goes through Malcolm X's life from his childhood to his teens to the time that he spent in prison and then finding religion and really changing his life and the path that he was going down in life. And this book just gave me so much food for thought 
bringing up concepts that I'd never thought of before because I'd never had to think of them before, bringing up stuff that I can even apply to my own life of how people treat me and how I treat other people and I think this was just probably the most rewarding book that I read last year but maybe possibly the most rewarding book that I've ever read because I know that this is going to be something that I can revisit you know I feel like I took in every ounce of this but I know that say if I was to read it in 10 years time there's going to be different elements of this that stand out to me then that didn't stand out to me when I was in my 20s. The writing was incredible, I think the story was incredible. My favourite part of this was definitely when Malcolm X ended up going on his pilgrimage because I feel like that's when he really found himself because there is a good portion of this after he gets out of prison where you can tell he feels in debt to Elijah Muhammad and there's a lot of regurgitating of Elijah Muhammad's beliefs and at a certain point I was just waiting for it I was waiting for him to be like but this is how I feel or this is how I see the world or this is what I want to do because there was a lot of Mr Muhammad says this and Mr Muhammad thinks that and at a certain point that gets a little bit tiring but you know that it's going to come around but unfortunately it happened towards the end of his life there was so much that he still had left to do and I think that's what also makes this so hard to read. It is just, it's very heartbreaking to read. It was, like I said, it was probably the most emotional book that I read last year. It had just so much packed into it and I would definitely recommend that everyone reads this at some point throughout their life. Um, and I feel like everyone's going to get something different from it, but it's, it is a very, very valuable read. Just an absolutely brilliant autobiography, best autobiography that I've ever read. So those were the best books that I read in 2020. Let me know your thoughts if you've read any of them, if you agree with my rating or if you don't. Let me know the best book that you read in 2020 because as always I always like hearing your thoughts and seeing if I can get any more book recommendations from you. And thank you so much to Skillshare again for sponsoring this video and I hope you guys enjoyed and I will talk to you soon. Goodbye.